Good evening, viewers. Session six of the Food Premier Development Program will take us back to Nilufa's Kitchen in Toronto and Zaveer's Chocolate Workshop in Bangalore. I continue to believe that the best part of a virtual meeting is the opportunity to travel to any part of the world. And if you have as vivid an imagination as I do, well, then you can have a jolly good time in your head. Before I proceed with this session, I'd appreciate if you would allow me two minutes to take a quick poll. I'll be putting up a set of questions. You just need to take it some multiple choice. This will help me with some statistics as well as curate future sessions. So everyone who's present here, please participate. It's anonymous so you can answer frankly. Thank you. You have to start the poll. I've started the poll. I've launched it. It's not showing up. It is. Can everybody see it? Okay, thanks, Vera. Sorry, there are still some people uh, filling in the questionnaire, so I think we should be through in a few more seconds. Okay, I think we're done. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, many of you will recognize Nilufa from our first cooking demo, but for the benefit of newcomers, I'll briefly introduce her. Born and raised in Karachi, which stays in London and Dubai, and finally settling Toronto, Nilufa Mawalwala has traveled extensively. She's published two Parsi cookbooks, receiving three awards. She strongly believes that while we are identified by race, religion, and color, we share the tightest bonding through food. I'll also briefly touch upon Zaver. Zaver is the proprietress of Galliano's Chocolates. But that's as far as I'll go with the introduction because I'd like Zaveer to tell us her story in her own words. 
as always if you have any questions during the session please put it in the chat box and i will throw these questions to our demonstrators as and when um, i feel it's apt dilufa if you're ready with your mixing bowl and whisk we can start absolutely yeah. over to you thank you so first of all thank you for having me and it's always so much fun to do these zoom demos i'm so happy that we have these technologies and like zareen said best part is we can be anywhere in the world so today we are going to do crepes and crepes is something that is so versatile that you can fill it with whatever you want savory sweet even a simple lemon and sugar makes it amazing uh so there is a difference between crepes and pancake pancake is a thick uh, uh sort of a well not a bread but it's thicker than a crepe and crepe is as thin as they come you have to try and get it as thin as you can but that also comes with practice so don't worry it's very simple it's more the sort of the movement of the arm the, the wrist rather than anything else because when i pour it i just have to do this to make sure that it sort of runs all over the base and that's what makes it a thin crepe so today what i have done is i have one ready which has been sitting here for an hour which i will make but before that i will make one for you now the batter for my crepe is everywhere on the blog in this book uh so in this book it's on page 54 the um, uh, book has the crepes it's also my signature dish because this is what i started with and i absolutely love making crepes i always have a stash of crepes in the freezer they freeze really really well and that way you don't have to always um uh, kind of make just 10 you can make as many as you want at one time and put them in the freezer on a sheet of foil and parchment and they come out with the video these for the second half so i got this here now to start with i have one cup of flour which has been sieved and in it i have baking powder and salt i have a uh, glass or a 8 ounce uh, measuring cup of milk i'm using whole milk now we don't have to warm it but if you warm it uh, it mixes easily and in this you need some melted butter and with that i will be doing two eggs that have to be beaten separately now you can dump them in but if you beat them separately you will get lighter crisps you don't have to do the yolk and the white separately just the egg separately beating the eggs first before everything else is a good idea because you don't want to wash your beaters again if you don't beat it first and you beat this first you'll have to wash your beaters to beat the eggs so just beat them So these are done just kind of light and frothy and the milk is done it's not boiling hot it's just warm and 
two tablespoons of melted butter. And then you just mix it all in. You can do this with a spoon, a spatula, whatever you want. We just want the incorporation and no lumps. That's all we are looking for. Now, if you don't have a beater, pour little milk at a time so that it, the lumps go away faster. If you pour all the milk, it's harder. If you have a beater, it doesn't matter. And then you just pour in the egg. Make sure all of it is released from the sides. Now you can make your crepe straight away if you're in a rush, but by leaving it alone for at least half an hour, you're allowing the gluten to thicken your mixture, which just makes it easier. That's all. So we've got this mixture and we'll allow it to sit for a little while and I will make it from the other mixture. Now one thing very important to remember is to mix it well before you start because somehow there's always this thick film on top which forms as we leave it alone. So mix it well before you start. Whether it's savory or whether it's sweet, it's the same recipe. And the milk, I'm sorry, the salt in it is important. That pinch of salt is very important. Don't avoid it. Now, we'll make some crepes, but before that, let's make the chicken filling. So I have here six, uh, about six ounces of butter and I'm going to put three tablespoons of flour in it. And I'm just making a white sauce basically and you can keep it as thin or thick as you prefer. So if you want it thicker, uh, the normal thing is if it's six ounces of butter, it would be six ounces of flour. And if you want it thinner, then you do this one. So if you want it slightly thicker than I make, you can always add an extra tablespoon. Try with an extra tablespoon first and then with two and then with three. But don't add it after you make the whole thing and then you decide. Because then the flour won't cook. But after you see mine, if you feel mine is too loose, then you think in your own mind. The other thing is that I would add an extra spoon of flour if I had decided not to use cream. But if I'm using cream, then it's thicker than milk and that also kind of balances everything out. The cheese, the addition of cheese also thickens the sauce. So all of these reasons is why we have this particular uh, combination, you know, of butter to flour. So once the flour, uh, sorry, the butter is melted, you put in the flour and as you can see, it's quite loose. Now at this point, you will see how thick or how thin your white sauce will be, okay? So if you are thinking, oh my God, this is too loose, then please add another tablespoon of flour. I'm not going to, I like it the way it is. Okay, now we are trying to cook the flour off and in that I'm going to add some milk. <clears throat>
Also, if you notice, the recipe asks for some chicken broth. And why? That is to bring out the chicken flavor in the sauce. You don't have to, but it kind of brings in that umami taste which it won't bring in. And it will be very cheesy and uh, less chickeny if you don't put it, but it will still work. So you don't have to kind of fret over it. If you don't have it, you don't have it. If you don't want to make it, that's fine too. So I'm just going to allow this to boil and bubble and thicken. Remember, when the sauce cools down, it will become thicker. Now, for the cheese, pick anything you want, any strong flavor cheese. That is what I am looking for. Now, I have some uh, very strong cheese and it is salty. So be careful with the salt. And this is a sage and cheddar. And you can put plain as well. The other thing that I like to do is buy a sort of a block of good cheese like Gruyere or whatever and shave it down together. And keep it in the freezer. So this is ready. Whenever I need a cup or half a cup, I just take it out from there. Now you can see that the roux is becoming tighter and after it comes to a boil, you must count up to 60 to make sure that every bit of your flour has been cooked. This is an important stage. And after that, you can lower your heat and start adding everything else. So I have three fourths of a cup of chicken broth. This is not too And then again, there's three fourths of a cup of cream. If you don't want cream, put some more milk. Put half milk, half broth, whatever you want. For the flavoring, salt and pepper is always safe. Now, don't put everything that I've got here. Pick and choose. So I have olives. I have sun-dried tomatoes. I have mustard. I have red pepper jelly. I have red peppers. I have pepper juice. I have, uh, yeah, all of this. So now pick and choose. Please don't try to put every single thing in it. It won't taste good. At the most, pick two. So if you're putting sun-dried tomatoes and some fancy cheese, that's more than enough. If you like a little bit of a bite to your uh, food, because a lot of Parsis prefer to have a little bit of spiciness to their food, then pick pepper juice or mustard, both of which are much sharper. Okay, so now I'm going to add my cheese and the cream. Allow all of that to melt. And then I have roasted chicken, which I have cubed. I'll quickly tell you how I roasted my chicken in a frying, uh, in a skillet. So I took four thighs and the thighs had skin on it. So I put salt and pepper on the side that didn't have the skin on it. And I pan fried the side that had no skin and then I turned it around and I cooked it on the side 
with the skin on it, allowing it to become nice and brown and crisp and allowing all the uh, fat to be released from it. But thighs take a little time. So once I knew that everything was crisp and brown, I added about uh, four tablespoons of water while it was hot and I allowed it to steam. I covered the pan and let it cook for 15 minutes. The water gets dry. We are gonna throw it out anyway. And the result is nice, firm chicken, which is already cooked through. Now, if you don't have any kind of chicken broth, then what I would do is I would not use the skin. The only reason I use the skin was A, not to have to remove it. B, it, it sort of saves the chicken from burning and drying. Afterwards, I just threw the skin out and it's so easy, right? But if you don't have chicken broth and you want to use it, then the other way to do is it to pan fry it on both sides without the skin, add the water and let it steam. And then use that water because that becomes into your chicken stock itself. So you don't have to go out and get three-fourths of a cup of chicken stock. It's too much to, you know, kind of, in my house, it's not wasted. Because as you know, I have classes all the time and I use up everything. But to buy this for six ounces is not fair. So this is your easier way of making your chicken broth. So I hope that helps. Now, whether it's three-fourths, or one and a half, or one and three fourths, or a little more, a little less, it won't matter at all. Now, as you can see, because I use the sage cheese, cheese which has sage in it, it's green. And my sauce has become slightly green. Yours will not be green. It will be the color of your cheese. So if you use a very dark yellow orange cheese, your sauce will be orange or yellow. And if you use a white cheese, your sauce will be more creamy brown colored after you add the chicken. Now, obviously the cream will bring it down a bit in color, I mean. And I've done all this. I'm going to get rid of my whisk once I know that everything is smooth. And then all I have to do is taste it for salt. You can add everything you want now, your chicken, whatever you've chosen, uh, mustard, if you've got very, very flat cheese, I always suggest mustard because mustard gives cheese a huge lift. I'm a great believer in using mustard and I'm a great believer in using Tabasco sauce. Three drops of Tabasco sauce and a teaspoon of mustard can do wonders for any white sauce. Okay, so now all of this is done. It's nice and smooth. I'm going to add the chicken. They are equally small dice. You can keep it as small or as big. But I particularly don't like to put it through a machine. These are hand cut for two reasons. It's not a mush. All of it becomes a mush and you don't really want it into a mush. So this is, I'm going to add to it uh, some These are sun-dried tomatoes. Now, if you have them in olive oil, that's fine too. If you don't, that's fine too. Mine are dried sun-dried tomatoes. I quite like it, but if you don't, that's fine. You know, for what are the some of the other things that we can add? Pepper is one. Yeah, um, so I have a pepper okay. dew pepper. Do you know what that is? Well, people in England usually use it. It's got a little bit of a bite to it and you can have them hot or mild or uh, medium. 
So it really depends on the sweetness or the uh, heat in it and it will tell you on the bottle. So that's wonderful. And then of course, roasted red peppers, you know. So we get yeah. these and you can chop it up or there's a red pepper jelly. Now this is for people like me who like a little bit of sweetness with their spiciness. It's more sweet than spicy, but it has a super flavor and I love such things. So again, if you find that your sauce is a bit flat or whatever, feel free. Now this is quite loose. The reason being your entire crepe kind of gets filled with the uh, sauciness. And I feel Parsis love their little bit of uh, not dry food. So I've kept it like this. I also use this sauce on my savory roulade and that's also the reason why it's a bit uh, loose. But like I said before, if you think this is too loose, start with one extra tablespoon of flour in, in the recipe. And then of course you can go on forward from there to do whatever you think best. Now, before I start on my crepes, because that I'm not going to make 10 crepes while you're standing there waiting for me, I'm only going to make two or three. But in the meantime, I am going to start on my orange, which you will see when at the end of it after we have spoken to Zabit. So I'm just melting a little bit of butter. And in the butter, I'm going to put orange juice. This is fresh orange juice and sugar. And all I'm doing is, and a pinch of salt, always a pinch of salt. Now, while the recipe is telling you between four and six tablespoons is oranges are from extra, extra sour to extra, extra sweet. So if you happen to land up with oranges that are extra sweet, you still need the sugar. Otherwise the syrup will not be made. However, if you find it very sweet, just add some extra lemon juice to it. You just need to make sure that that sweetness is cut through. You don't want it like uh, what we call so mitu uh, mitu Now I'm putting three, four, five. Okay, and after it's done, I will maybe take a taste of it. And all I'm trying to do is melt it down properly, that's all. And don't allow this to boil until all the sugar has melted. Very, very important. And I put the salt in my uh, orange juice. And then for flavor, this is fresh orange juice. Now we, you can put a whole uh, just the peel and then throw it out or you can slice it and put it or you can half, in, half it and put it but the peel flavor of the peel is absolutely delicious so I'm going to put this in make sure you wash your oranges properly and you're using something like a narangi kino it's such a wintery dish and the reason why it's wintery is because you eat it warm and luckily for you all, best oranges are there in the winter. So you should save this for your Christmas dinner. It's so delicious. It's one of our favorites. And it's something that has been a favorite, I believe, since the 50s, 60s. And now it's, you know, sort of easy to do at home. The other thing to remember is to make it in a skillet that is white because the same skillet will be used to add the folded crepes into. So now I'm just going to make sure that my sugar is melted. Why am I being so persistent about the sugar? 
So if I'm going to eat it straight off the bat, it's fine. But if I make this and I leave it for tomorrow, you will see that I, if I don't allow my sugar to melt, there'll be a thick crystallized covering on the top. And that, what I call kachar kachar in the mouth is not fun. So if you are careful for those two minutes to make sure that the sugar is all melted before we boil it, then it's fine. It won't happen, right? Okay, so I'm going to move this at the back. It should come to a boil and then some simmer for half an hour. So by the time we speak to Gaur and come back, it should be fine and done. Shall we give so you right a break? I've got it on a high and it will come down to a sort of a sticky thing. But I'll put it on a low simmer once the boil has come. That sort of helps with the timing. Uh, so, Zareen, I think I should make a crepe for everyone before we go. Sure. Yeah. Yes. So, you'll do a savory, you'll make a savory crepe right now. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, the, I'm making the crepe, filling it, and okay. then allowing Zara to talk, and then I'll make the crepe. So, that's sure, sure, okay. sure. So, right now, this is the morning thick one, and this is the just now thin one. This is also thickening up nicely, but you can see that this one is fairly thick compared to that one. Now, rule number one, always be prepared for the first grape to break. Rule number two, always make sure that your skillet is absolutely burning hot. And before you put any kind of butter or anything, you can always use a few drops of water to see it sizzle. If you don't do that, then 90% of the time your first grape will break and you can eat it happily. Or you can even put it under the, in, under the last grape if you want to. You don't have to eat it up. So there are several ways of uh, folding and rolling the grapes. You can make it in a roll like in this picture or you can even pile it up. So if you're piling it up, take a deep pan and then layer it. So you'll put one crepe, a little of the sauce, another crepe, a little of the sauce and just make a whole tier of it. And that is very family style and people can take as much as they want as long as they cut it deep with a spoon, it's soft. It's delicious. It doesn't matter. And I think that that is very simple for many, many people and they like to do it that way. So it's absolutely up to yourself. You choose how you like to do it. But you will obviously need a deep one. Okay, so you can see the sizzle and I'm going to start. Before I start, I have my lemon juice that I'm putting in my crepe to there. Okay. And this is the deep pan I'm talking about. If you want to layer the uh, pancakes, make sure that it's slightly larger than your pancake, like than your crepe. That's all. Now I'm looking for my my table. And I have put it here. Oh, yeah. Okay, losing it. So first, you have to put a little butter. In the first one, you'll need a little more. After that, literally just a drop to make sure that your skillet is kind of, uh, what would you call it, uh, greased properly. That's all you are looking for. So I'm just making sure that it goes in every corner. Keep a plate ready to overturn it on. You can see it's becoming brown. And if you can pick a ladle that fits exactly, or if you know that if you have to fill it half or three fourths, then you won't have to worry about the size or the shape or it being half, half is done or anything like that. So, now as thin as you can go, the very important part is your hand movement. That's all. Nothing else matters. 
and then you have about 30 seconds. So a lot of people don't even flip the tray. They cover it. And as soon as this is dry, they pop it out. But you don't have to be so worried. It does flip. And it flips better when this side is brown. So you put it underneath and flip. And that other side, you're just drying out. So it generally needs a little less time. And then you flip it out onto your plate. So this side is always less colored than the other. But when I fold it, all the lovely caramelized ones will come on the top. And that's the idea. So I'm going to make one more before we hand it over. You can go as broad as you want. The diameter should actually be usually the bottom of the skillet. Otherwise, it becomes harder for you to turn around. And you know these edges that you can see? They are nice and crispy. And when they are crispy, they leave the sides. And when they leave the sides, you know that that is an indication that it's ready to be turned. So all these little, little things you get with practice. And my suggestion to you is always make more crepes rather than less in one time. Turn the music on and enjoy your half an hour of peace. It is so, so relaxing, I can't tell you. So, I won't waste your time. I will just fill this up and roll it out. And that's it. So, again, if you have a measuring spoon, you know that you have to get 10, 10 uh, spoons out of this. So you would know which spoon to use and how much to fill. And then you just fill it in the middle. And you have this other bowl ready. And you just put it down. And then you save a little bit of the sauce on the top also, we'll fill it up. You know? nice and saucy. You can put more or less. You can put a little bacon in it if you want. Anything. Anything flavorful. The other way to do it is to fold it in. So if you fold both the sides in and then roll it, it will become smaller, but it won't leak out as much. So that's another way of doing it. And uh, if anybody wants to see it, I'll be happy to do it in the next round. I think I'll allow uh, Zareen to move on so I don't take up all the time. Zareen? Uh, yeah, thanks. thanks you know, we'll be back. Yeah, we'll be back and give you a chance to clear your kitchen. Uh, my first thank you to you. I know uh, how much trouble you take to get this set up and I really, really appreciate it. No thank trouble you. at all. Always a pleasure. Okay, we'll be back soon. So yeah. um, let's move on to Zaver's workshop in Bangalore. Um, Yazdi, can we spotlight Zaver? over 20 years and it all started with chocolate. 
uh, when I was running my little hole in the wall restaurant, Zavir approached me to stock a few bags of chocolate uh, in the hope that my customers would purchase them. Though our friendship has grown much beyond chocolate, Gallianos is still my go-to destination for any and every chocolate order I have over all over India. Um, okay, why, why did I choose Zaver to do this workshop on um, chocolate? Uh, I know there are lots of food preneurs here who are either in the business or wanting to get into the business. Um, and therefore, I thought it would be nice if Zaver came in and spoke to us a little bit about uh, the chocolate world. And she's been here in the chocolate world for over 20 years, if I'm not mistaken. So welcome, Zaver. And um, let me try to share a little bit about your journey with chocolate. Sure. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, actually, 20 years is a long time, if one has to put it in a few minutes. But uh, yes, I got into this business, uh, not something planned, uh, very different when I came back uh, from the US. Uh, we were being invited out for dinners. And somehow I couldn't find good chocolate the way we get abroad, like the good Ivas, etc. And I love cooking. So I just made a couple of them to give as gifts. And before I knew it, I was being asked where I bought them from, where they could buy it from. And that's how this whole thing started. It was something, you know, like an idea that had happened and it just worked out. I've been in this for the last 20 years. It's a long 20 years. Uh, it's been very fulfilling. If I sit today and think back on it, it's really been a fulfilling journey. We've had some amazing contracts. We've had some amazing clients where we've supplied our chocolates to. And uh, today, you know, I can comfortably sit back and, you know, uh, people have tasted it. They just walk into my workshop. Uh, whoever walks in doesn't come in to browse or anything. They've just tried our chocolate and they just come in to buy, you know. And we've had chocolates that have gone all over, not just all over India, because we ship all over the country, but it has traveled all the way to Switzerland. I've had my chocolates go to the US, Canada, everywhere. And we've had got amazing responses, really amazing. You know, I could sit and tell you story after story about this. But, uh, you know, the funny thing is, Aved, is you're not even, you didn't start off being trained to do chocolate. You were in a completely different field, if I'm not mistaken. That's right. That's right. My background is electronics, uh, computers. And then uh, I was with this company in Bombay who I worked with. And I started over there in the electronic division, which I was heading. Uh, then after, uh, you know, they kind of sold that division, they started another division. This was a big uh, you know, corporate. So they started a division to do export of garments. And uh, I just got into that. And before I knew it, I was traveling all over the globe and learning quite a bit on it. Uh, somehow uh, it was amazing because I was based in the US. I set up their operations there. I was based in Toronto, set up their operations there for them. And uh, finally I came back in 2000, the year 2000 to India and uh, this journey of my chocolates has started since then. Uh, like I said, I just love cooking. And uh, I started doing this. And over the years, I have learned a lot. Whoever would like to know about this, my first advice to them is chocolate is very, very temperamental. Okay, it's, uh, You really need to know a lot scientifically. And you can do that by reading up, learning about it, and practicing a lot. It requires a hell of a lot of patience because you can't just start the stove on high. And first thing you'll know, you'll learn, uh, you know, burning the chocolate. 
So it requires a lot of patience. I remember once reading somewhere, someone had written, if you want to be a chocolatier, you need to have the patient of a saint, you know. <laughs> so it's very, very true. You have to very delicately work with chocolate. And I have done it over the years. I have experimented a lot. I've had a lot of batches which, you know, have got spoiled. Uh, we've done, I, I mean, I can tell you thousands and thousands of boxes, you know, over the years we've shipped out. So you learn as, you know, you progress, you learn a lot about the product. But I can tell you one thing, you need knowledge, you need skill, you need creativity, and you need to put in long, long hours. So shall we just start with the basics? So I'm sure everybody's aware that we basically get three kinds. We have a dark and a milk and a white. When you're conversing with people, you say, no, 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 I'm, I'm a dark chocolate person. So what really is the difference between these three forms of chocolate? Uh, I'll just go a step uh, back. See, sure. doc, chocolate is actually, one is what they call Kuwaita chocolate, which what some people say is pure chocolate, which is made from the cocoa pod, which grows on the tree. Uh, the seeds are removed and then accordingly they are dried, roasted, just like coffee beans, you know, and then they're ground. And then you get a dark cocoa liquor. Right. This cocoa liquor, when separated, you get cocoa butter too from it. So this is pure chocolate. It's called Kuwaita chocolate. And this you can do with dark. In dark, you have to add the cocoa solid. You add cocoa butter and a little bit of sugar, depending on the strength that you want of bitterness. Okay. Milk chocolate is more, less of cocoa solids, more of milk and milk substitutes. And white chocolate, there is absolutely no cocoa solids. They don't term it as chocolate. It is just cocoa butter, milk solids, maybe a little bit of vanilla and sugar in it. Now, this is Kuwaita chocolate. So all professional chocolatiers will use this mainly. But if you're working for with chocolate at home, then you get what they call off the shelf compound chocolates. And compound yeah. chocolates has negligible cocoa butter. It has a lot of vegetable fat or palm oil, things like that. And uh, it is easier to work with because you don't need to temper it. Uh, you can just melt it and use it in whatever you want. Uh, but the only thing is that when you're using a compound chocolate, uh, just keep in mind, you will compromise on the taste of good chocolate. Okay, so if you, okay, I'm presuming you use Kuvetra. Well, I use both, I'll be honest with you, because okay. India uh, as a country is very hot, the temperatures. Right. So if I have to use Kuvetra, then Kuvetra starts melting at about 32 degrees. Ooh. And so if I have to shoot. Yeah, anywhere in India, in some yeah. other yeah. Unless Bangalore, you're in Bangalore. <laughs> so uh, if you know, if you use uh, compound chocolate, the melting point is much higher. So you can ship it out all over the country easily. Even though in summer, I don't ship to areas like Delhi and all where the temperatures are like 43, 45 degrees, because even that melts. Right. Unless you can uh, be sure that you can have a cold chain you know, all yeah. the way from the time it leaves my workshop till the customer's end, then it is safe to ship chocolate. But between the two, compound chocolate has a higher melting point, so it's safer, it will melt at a higher temperature, while Kuwaita will start melting. In fact, its melting point is less than our body temperature. So the moment you put it in your mouth, it starts melting. Yeah, got it. Uh so when you're saying, do, so do we get both available in India as a raw ingredient? And what, like, what would you uh, recommend to people who want to get started in this business? What should they use? See, uh, you get both of them over here. You will get Kuvaita, you will get compound chocolates. Uh, the only thing, if you are starting out and you're really serious, then I would say, do experiment with Kuvaitas. 
it is a very time consuming process to learn tempering to get it right because if you don't temper it right your chocolate's bound to melt it's going to have grainy effects it's going to have that white dots which is like a white bloom as they say because the cocoa butter separates from it uh, but if you're just wanting to do a little bit you know kind of then there's no harm in using compound chocolate just to begin you know like you want to uh, just do a little bit of say chocolate sauce or just plain chocolate with nuts things like that then start with that so at least you get a little bit of hang of it and then move on to kuvechers so what exactly when you say tempering what exactly are you talking about see tempering is a process by which when you melt chocolate cocoa butter uh, you know has certain molecules in them Okay. So those molecules are about six fat molecules. So those six fat molecules, I may be a little technical here, so stop me if it's too technical. Those six fat molecules separate. The uh, if you want to get these uh, six fat molecules back, the most important of them, of course, being the molecule number uh, five for us. Uh, if you want those uh, fat solids to get back again for the chocolate to hold its shape. that is the process of tempering so what you will do is you will melt chocolate first if it's dark chocolate up to about 115 degrees fahrenheit don't go beyond that on a very slow double boiler so you have you know like water down and you have another container in which you chop the chocolate fine put it on top of the double boiler and on very slow like you know simmer melt it uh it's very important to have a thermometer when you're working with kuvechers you can't work without a thermometer so it shouldn't go beyond 115 degrees fahrenheit which is about say 45 46 degrees centigrade and once it melts get it off and you have to kind of just slowly stir and cool it and what you could do is keep some of that powdered uh, chocolate which you chopped in the beginning at the side and just add it to this hot chocolate and bring the temperature down you have to bring it down from 45 to roughly if it's dark chocolate again to about say 31 uh, 30 31 degree centigrade once it reaches that temperature then again it has to be brought up to about 32 degrees you know to kind of uh, let it be stable because that's only when those fat molecules will start binding otherwise they don't bind and you won't be able to have a chocolate to work with okay so that is the tempering process which is a slightly professional process it needs practice it's not that you know you can't do it it's not rocket science but you just need to uh, keep practicing to get the temperatures right and in case if this chocolate also gets spoiled you can reuse it remelt it and repractice on it you know so it's not that if the batch has got spoiled you got to throw it away you can just okay. remelt it again to 45 but this yeah. i'm talking when i talk about dark chocolate milk and white are slightly less like milk may be about say 39 degrees uh, you get it to and then white is a little less so the more the cocoa solids the slightly higher the temperature okay. and then would i require any special equipment if i want to start a chocolate business yes you would require certain basic things like you would need a double boiler and if you're going to do a lot of chocolate then i would recommend investing in a tempering machine because it's fine to temper like the stable top tempering you know where you're cooling the chocolate but if you're doing large batches like you know Ten, uh, twenty kilo batches, or more, fifty kilo batches at a time. Then you have to invest in a tempering machine, and you definitely need thermometers. You'll definitely, if you're going to make chocolates, then you will need chocolate molds. I'll show you some of the molds we have. This is basically a silicon mold. You know, nowadays you can get them off Amazon. Yes. So uh, these are flexible molds, and you can pour your chocolate once it's tempered into this. we also get the plastic molds or you get the polycarbonated molds and uh, you know again you get it in different shapes different sizes so depending on your requirement you know you can use any of these both are fine to use did you get your molds uh, made because i know there's a big 
big fat G on top of each of your chocolates. That's right. We got our molds customized. There are mold manufacturers in India. So they will uh, do the design you want. If you want different shape, whatever, whatever weight, if you want a bar of chocolate, you want a design on the bar, everything can be done, but it comes at a cost. Like if you're making a mold, it could cost you anywhere from 20 to 30,000 to make a mold. Really? Yes. Oh, yeah. it's, so it's, they have to probably, yeah, make one. Uh, yeah, and it then... is a metal mold. And then from that, you know, you get trays made. So those yeah. trays, you need about 50 trays. At least I use about 200 trays at a time to work with. So you need that many trays. Right. Uh, talking about adding, you know, things to chocolate. So these are your pictures, Aver. So there's That's chili right. there. I mean, it could be orange. It could be nuts. Uh, can you add liquor? Can you add anything and everything chocolate or are there some limits? Uh, there are limits. Please keep one thing in mind. You shouldn't have water touch chocolate. Even a little bit of steam or even a couple of drops of water and your chocolate will seize. Seize means it becomes lumpy. You can't work with it anymore. So then you can uh, not use that for chocolate, but you can add a little bit of fat to it. And then once you add fat, whether it's a couple of spoons of melted butter or a little vegetable oil, you can then use it for a ganache or you can use it for, uh, you know, some kind of a sauce, chocolate sauce or anything like that. But you won't be able to use it for making chocolates. And... Uh, uh, my suggestion would be that obviously start with compound first. It's an easier chocolate to work with and then move on to the curvatures. So don't use anything that is water-based because water will ruin your chocolate. So even if you're using flavors, essences, please see that they are either oil-based or alcohol-based. None of them should be water-based like the essences we get in the store. Those are water-based. So don't use those for your chocolates. Otherwise, your chocolates will seize. Then you can use nuts. Like uh, we use a lot of things in our chocolates. I have this little platter. I don't know if you can see, but I have, I use marshmallows. I use figs. I use cacao nibs. I use lots of dry fruits, nuts. Uh, we use, uh, you know, biscuits. We make chocolate biscuits. I have over here, different things which I can show you. Like we've used marshmallows. So we have these marshmallow pops, you know, which are coated with chocolate. Uh, we have apricots, which we have coated in chocolate. Then we have these chocolate logs, which have cranberries, nuts, blueberries inside. Uh, chocolate coated biscuits again, you know, so. The best. Yeah. And then, like I said, you know, you can play around with chocolate. You can mix a, a dark and white chocolate. You can have milk and white, you know, just initially, just I would suggest whoever would like to do it, try your own flavors. You have to be a little creative with what you want. Uh, we do an apricot and honey. We do fig and almond. I do a peanut butter strawberry. Uh, there's anything, fresh fruits you can use, but you have to puree them. You know, don't use it as a cut fruit in chocolate because again, your chocolate will get spoiled because of the water content of the fruit. So try to use dried fruits. Uh, you know, you get nowadays dried pineapples, you get dried strawberries, dried kiwis. If you want to use fresh, then just make a puree out of it and let that really thicken and then use that as a filling inside the chocolates. So you can either have a chocolate plate or you can have filled chocolates, you know where you make it into a shell, you put a filling in and then you close it. Um, how important do you think packaging is in your business? Very, very. Especially if you're doing it for the corporates, you will see we have a lot of packaging behind us. So like these are all my gift packagings. These are all the packagings that we've developed for corporates. So at festival time, a lot of the corporates, which is our major business, uh, you know, they want their logo branding on the boxes. They want logo branding on the ribbons or the chocolate. So for all of this, you know, uh, it's very important to have really, really nice packaging done. You know, development of, uh, you know, whether it's a cloth pouch or whether it's a box, it has to look nice. It has to look gifty finally. 
um what would you say have been your highs and what were what are the pitfalls in your business highs have been many zareen uh we have uh, supplied to a lot of the five star hotels where our chocolate has gone as the bedside chocolate in every single room you know so every night they would have our chocolates put next to the bedside uh we have even supplied our chocolates on flights international flights to the foreign airlines i have supplied chocolates to international retail brands you know the top retail brands internationally so uh, it's really a satisfying feeling at the end of it you know when you have your chocolates going there i actually have had foreign ships from five star hotels uh compliment us you know Uh, on the chocolate we make and have insisted that we should expand our business and you know kind of go beyond what we are doing so uh, over the years i've had i so many people so many stories where they've come and you know really enjoyed our chocolates and we we love to create and develop new stuff like if i have a customer come to me and say look you know i want something like this i want extra dark cocoa i want whatever we will experiment we will work with them i've had suppliers of different items come and say we want to incorporate this into chocolate so like for example we had the largest alcohol group in the country at one time uh you know approach us that they wanted liquor chocolates of their liquors so we worked on it and we send them the batches and i'm really happy to say that we beat one of the five star hotels when we packed that contract so wow. we have done i've done thousands and thousands of boxes of liquor chocolates you know and of course this was years ago because at that time we had an excise license uh after that has stopped uh you know now the we've surrendered the license so i don't do liquor chocolates but we've done tremendous amount of liquor chocolates whether it's whiskey brandy rum wines you name it so i mean these are big highlights you know which we've done over the years there's so many stories like this i can tell you so would you have any alerts for anybody who wants to get into it saying this is where you need to take care if you're getting into this business uh yes i will tell them one thing is it's not easy to work with especially if you're doing kuvetcha it is not an easy chocolate be prepared that there will be pitfalls you will have batches getting spoiled uh you also will have competition by way of housewives who are doing it you know and it, they just think it's something that you melt chocolate at home and then kind of uh, do it so uh, you know all these things will be there you'll have customers who will be so price uh, conscious and not bothered about the quality who will say okay you know we want it so cheap and all so and it's a difficult market to break into you know if you're starting out it's not an easy market to get because uh, it's already saturated by a lot of all this so unless you have something really good really unique about your product and uh, you know you can really share that out there then yes it's great business to be in but just being a chocolatier it's not you will have to either then expand into uh, you know say baking or brownies or cookies and you know right. or you have to wait you should have that time to grow the business if you think overnight within 6 months you will make it think big it won't happen you know it's been a very long journey and it's not easy that's all i would tell have perseverance be ready to work hard and you know be creative about the product thank you zaver well i was want to tell everybody that if by the end of this they have still not been convinced that galliano's chocolates are certainly the best and uh, you know the quality the taste of the chocolates i think we need to share that very one special video zaver that we yes. have so this just to give a little light uh, heartedness to the program i'm going to share a video which is very close to my heart actually this was one of our junior models <laughs> the chocolate one spoon of the carrot one lick of the chocolate one spoon of the carrot 
want to introduce Janine was his youngest customer Does daddy approve Thank you so much Say thank you Zaver auntie that was from my personal archives <laughs> that was my grandson when he was just a baby and um, we sent this to zaver and she was absolutely delighted that uh, this yes your youngest customer and i'm sure he still will be so the next time i'm flying to perth galenos comes with me zaver thank you very very much i think there uh, are there questions which are yeah so i'm going to yes i'm going to put that out um where do one one second what brand of cooking chocolate do you use okay i use imported i'll be honest with you because i find the quality of the indian chocolates still not up to mark uh this being the reason because uh you know the cocoa beans that i use which is the very foundation of chocolate are not the best quality so a lot of the indian manufacturers don't use the cocoa beans which come from ghana and uh, you know the coast of ivory so i prefer to use imported chocolate um but if you have to use your you know uh it's expensive i'll be honest with you but if you have to use cooking chocolate then there are brands over here uh, you get vanilla you get 2m you get dukes you get morde so a lot of these brands are available which you should find in the stores you know if you want to start with and then maybe graduate to the imported more expensive chocolates um beros wants to know do you have a recommendation for someone who's allergic to chocolate is there an alternative uh I just like her to explain to me when she says allergic to chocolate. What is it that she's allergic to in the chocolate? Is it? Um, yes. Think could we unmute um, Beros so she, we can she can ask the question. We have a little time. I think. Oh, find Beros. Yes. Thank you, Zari. Uh, I was not allergic to chocolate till nearly fifty years, and then suddenly one fine day, I got allergic to chocolates. I started getting hives. But oh. the funny thing is that I, if I eat certain, if I eat chocolate, pure chocolate, irrespective of white or milk, or it, nothing happens to me. But if I eat anything made with chocolate, like chocolate cake mousse, I get an allergy. so they did all kinds of tests tested me out and when i eat eat anything else that is mixed with chocolate nothing happens but i don't know if it is a certain percentage or what kind of cocoa or what is it that gives me an allergy i think that you would really have to get pinpointed because if you're saying chocolate as such when you eat plain doesn't give you an allergy then i don't think it could be chocolate it would be what uh, the items are made it could be a nut allergy because usually uh, chocolate sometimes you could have you know mixed with nuts or even nahi kai nahi tatu liquor chocolates nothing happens nut chocolates nothing happen so nothing you... happens if i eat it as a chocolate chocolate but the moment if i you melt the same chocolate into something i it hits me so i have tried doctors i have tried allergists but i was just curious because one day i spoke about it to the lady who owns theo broma yes and she said it is the kind of cocoa she, uh, that you are using so is there something different kind of cocoa that you use for chocolate and you use as cocoa cocoa cooking chocolate something different that's all i mean basically i i want to know okay chocolates are made from a different kind of cocoa and 
cooking is a different kind of cocoa or how is it? No, the cocoa is not different. It's the acetic content which is different. Okay, all right. Got so you. depending on the acidity of the cocoa, that could impact you. Ah. But otherwise, cocoa is made from a cocoa bean, you know. Yes, and, yes. Uh, the cocoa beans depend, again, how they're grown, where they're grown. Sometimes cocoa trees are growing near other trees. So even that could maybe influence the cocoa powder. Oh, okay, okay. Here. So, you know, okay. some people grow uh, pepper or some people will grow uh, any other tree next to a cocoa tree. Because okay. cocoa trees need shade. So even that may make a difference, but to really pinpoint, I think it would be more a doctor, you know, who could yes, it, we, uh, you. Yes, yes, the allergists have tried it in U US and the final conclusion was, since you got it after so many years, just have patience, it will automatically go away after on its own. So I'm just living the time out. Okay. It's strange, but so I just thought I'd pick your brains to see if there is some kind of cocoa that could have led to, you know. That really depends because there's so many different varieties, you know. Yeah, okay, okay. Sorry, sorry to ask you this odd question. <laughs> Thank okay, you, Sari. So welcome, Veros. Maruk has written Gallinos is the best. She can vouch for it. So Thank here's you, Maruk. <laughs> um, for Coverage chocolate. Does one have to use cocoa butter? I don't know what is coverage. Um, uh, are you talking about coating chocolate? Is that what the person is asking? That is, if you're making a shell or coating it. Can it be melt? Okay. It says she's asking. I'm sorry. There's no name because it's Galaxy M31. Um, also asking, can it be melted in a microwave? Yes, you can. You can, but please don't do it at a, a long temperature, you know, do it in 30 seconds pulses. So, you know, put a minimum, at least put about 250, 300 grams of chocolate, put it for 30 seconds, uh, stir it, get it out, stir it, then again, put it for about 30 seconds until you find that it has reached the melting consistency. If you overheat it, it will burn and it will get lumpy. So don't do that. Okay, I can't see any, I don't know what this coverage means, but um, I, I can't even address the person. For coverage chocolate, does one have to you? Oh, Rashna Barya. Okay. okay. Uh, Rashna, I'm sorry, I don't understand the coverage chocolate. Um, can we unmute uh, Rashna Galaxy M31? Sorry, I think it was a spell check that did it. Ah, okay, no problem. So I wanted to say coage or chocolate, does one have to use uh, cocoa butter? No, you don't have to. It already mm -hmm. contains cocoa butter. So coage okay. chocolate, with, a good coage chocolate should have minimum 35 to 40% cocoa uh, so, right. and cocoa butter. Okay. So uh, you okay. don't need to add any more cocoa butter to it. You just have to temper it well. That's the main thing in Kuvecha chocolate. And for compound also, there's no need to add uh, cocoa butter? Nothing, nothing. You don't need to add cocoa butter or anything in it. In a uh, compound chocolate, you just melt it over a double boiler and you can use it right away. Okay. And when you're tempering it, you usually bring it down to that certain temperature and then take it up again. So yes. you, does one have to you do it on that stone slab and all that? Does one need to do all that? Or you can See, just wait till the temperature comes down? No, you. what you have to do is keep stirring in the bowl, like if you're doing in a microwave. Right. So you bring the temperature, you have to have a thermometer. So bring it up to about 45 degrees, not right. more than that, otherwise you'll burn it if it's dark chocolate. And then again, cool it down. Right. So what you can do to cool it down is keep stirring and right. add a little bit, keep aside a little bit right. of that chopped chocolate and add it. Uh, this right. is what, if I'm being a little technical, is called seed chocolate. You see, okay. there's a certain molecule which has to bind. Right. Okay. If you don't bind that, then your chocolate will not set. Right. So to get that started, just oh, one seed to get it started, keep a little bit of that chocolate aside, add that powdered chocolate in the melted chocolate, keep right. stirring it, keep the thermometer there, and right. then bring it down 
to about 28, 29 degrees. Oh. And then okay. again, you need to slightly take it up to 32 degrees. All right. 32 degrees would be the ideal temperature to work with it. All right. So don't okay. start working at 28, 29 when it's cold because it will set. You need right. to get it up to 32 degrees and then you start working with curvature. All right. And then once it comes to 32 degrees, I can work with it. And can I keep it at that temp? I mean, uh, can I use it after half an hour or so if I have to work no, with it? you have to keep it at that temperature. So either have a heat pad or, you know, again, bring it to that temperature because chocolate will cool down. It all depends on the temperature of the room. See, it's very sensitive. So temperature of the room, temperature of your mold, everything, the humidity in the air, all this plays a part. So, you know, it's very important to have the temperatures right. Okay, so the temperature has to be 32 all the time. Yes, that's the temperature right. you need to work with for dark chocolate. Milk and right. white is slightly lower. Lower, all right. Okay. Thank you very much. Now, Jazavir, if somebody has questions, would you be happy to answer them via email? And may I share your email address? Yeah, do that. Definitely. Okay. So I will put the, put Zavir G, am I right? Yes. G at or you G can put galianos at gmail.com. That's the official yeah. email. So this is Zavir's email address. Uh, if she'll be happy to answer any questions you have even in the days ahead. Definitely, let me know. All right, I think we're good. Um, thank you again very, very much. My I know pleasure. I have uh, made you go back to your workshop at a time when you should be at home. <laughs> I appreciate it very much. But don't go away because you and Nilofa have to show us how we can use chocolate with the crepes that Nilofa has made. Right, sure. Nilofa? Oh. Ready to go back to Toronto? All uh -huh. right, let's move. <laughs> uh, let's spotlight Nilofa and have her back. Great. Right. So, uh, Zare, first of all, that is very interesting. I also have a question. Of how yeah. is it that sometimes you find the same chocolate, like lint, uh, even something like lint, not as smooth as the last time or or is it just your taste refining if you like something for 10 years but you found something better no see it happens it happens even in brands like lint and all uh what uh, will happen is if you don't conch the uh, cocoa beans well that is they are not ground to a, that fine consistency and sometimes you will feel, you know, a little bit powdery effect in your mouth. Yes. After, yeah. so, after this. Yeah. Yes. So that will happen. If the chocolate is not tempered well, you will have that problem also. So it is highly possible, you know, to find all these even in the branded chocolate sometimes. Absolutely. That smoothness yeah. depends on the quality. It starts right from the stage of the quality of the cocoa bean. Right, right from right. there through the whole process. So like I say, it's a very scientific process, you know. Food, in a way, is a lot of science. You need to realize it is, that it is, it is, if you is, don't yeah. get that right, you will have problems along the different steps. My mom used to make a lot of chocolate things and use a lot of these commercial ones. Like, yeah. uh, But we found that the French one was the best over and above the Swiss one. So we used to get it from the front. See, uh, the thing with European chocolatiers are that they are very, uh, what should I say, not mask bulk produced. You know, like Swiss, if you see Cayer or if you see uh, Lint and all these guys, they do a lot of mass production. The French uh, are very, uh, they're very chocolatiers, you know, so very personalized chocolates you will find. So right. actually go into the depth of the science of it, learning uh, how to come out with the best quality, the best quality of cocoa beans, the best grinding, how to blend it, how much of cocoa, how much of cocoa butter, everything. So yes, you will find the European chocolate is much far higher, you know, as far as the taste and the quality goes. Very interesting. I wish I can try some of your chocolates soon. When I come, I wish I knew you in Toronto when I was there. I would have carried some for you. Next year? <laughs> <laughs> so 
hopefully god willing okay okay guys so first of all before i move on i want to show you how thick this has become compared to what it was because it has cooled down so it's not going to slide all over anymore so again if you were thinking of adding more flour don't go more than a tablespoon that's my personal recommendation because you don't want it like a lump and when it It, even if it oozes out, the flavors are so much nicer when it's smooth and soft and oozy. So that's just my uh, personal thing. Now, moving on to the crepes rosette, everything is done. You can see a slight film of butter coming to the edges because now the orange juice has reduced its syrupy. The other fun part of this is normally I know we Parsis don't have six people around the table, especially in places like Karachi and Bombay, and we always have a larger crowd. But this sort of a dessert can be made for fifty people also, but it's easier to make it for a smaller crowd. And as I go along, the fun part of it is it will get thicker and thicker. because of the gluten from the pancake the crepe uh, kind of coming into the sauce so it's very uh, uh, sort of normal when you say that the first five i'm going to put five at a time so the first five will have a liquidy sauce versus the second five will have a thicker sauce and the last five will literally have something that you would spread over so it's very normal that it becomes like that also if you uh, do 15 crates and you ate 12 and three were left and naturally there's very little sauce left so you're going to put the whole thing in the fridge with the sauce and everything and uh, when you take it up tomorrow it's going to be totally different it's going to be like a spread so you can thin it down if you want it to if you want to eat it just like that just warm it again and have it like that but crepe suzettes taste the best when it's warm they don't taste good when they're chilled they don't have to be bubbling hot unless it's really canadian mint out there but other than that you can eat it when they are warm and they do taste great now normally these will be brought to your table in a restaurant on a trolley and uh, it normally a flambe is done and yeah. that's the way it's you know sort of presented to you so what you would do if you wanted to is out of the three tablespoon of liqueur add two first add to it and then when you would sort of present it you would take a spoon that is quite big a metal spoon and you would heat the spoon heat the spoon and then going very close to the uh, bubbling boiling orange juice you would pour in the liqueur and normally i would suggest you do not pour that from a bottle straight there is a chance of getting burnt so you would take it out in a little uh, decanter or a bowl or whatever you want and pour it in because then you know that there's just that limited amount so even if it does catch flame properly it will die down in those 20 seconds that it's supposed to and not keep burning right also always keep a lid on the side god forbid you need to you just close the lid off turn the stove off i'm just talking about not catching fire it's not worth it nothing is worth it the flame is just for show and for burning the alcohol the alcohol still burns if you give it 3 minutes on the stove so if you are worried about children or very much alcoholic or whatever you can do that so there are other ways out also i'm very very partial to cognac and brandy and stuff like that and here we are very fortunate we get all sorts of cognacs and this is a caramel cognac i have i used to have a orange cognac whatever you want 
then you have Grommanier. Grommanier is a base of whiskey and orange and Cointreau, uh, which has got a very definitive uh, flavor to it. So whatever you like, you can put all three tablespoons of one uh, liqueur. If you don't have anything, don't fuss. Brandy and cognac does the trick absolutely brilliantly. If you're not one of those who likes a lot of alcohol, go easy on it. Uh, you can always allow the person who does like alcohol to pour their own. Uh, so it's fine. So about three tablespoons of this one is going to be fine. Uh, quite like sufficient uh, on the more side rather than the less side. And as you can see, it's bubbling and boiling. And then you just keep all your... Uh, all your uh, crepes ready to be served. Now, I wanted to show you how beautifully these trees and there's really, really zero difference if you are going to reheat them. So, I have this parchment. What the parchment does is it preserves it for much longer. That's what it does. Without it getting frostbite and freezer burn and whatever. And a lot of people will bother to put one between one parchment between each of these scripts. I don't. Nothing happened. So basically these, been, these have been frozen for about a month. I just took them out of the freezer and left them in the fridge overnight which is always the best way to thaw anything. Fish, meat, whatever. Don't leave it out. There's a huge difference between bringing the temperature down slowly and giving it a shock treatment. Okay? And then you take the caramelized side or the nice uh, brown side, not the wishy-washy side, to keep outside. And you fold them like this and keep them all ready. I'm going to turn this over because all of this seems to be on the other side. And this just gives it a little bit of a color when you are serving, that's all. And then with the point of the quarter, my little handkerchief, Going towards the inner side, you put them in. You will know best how much your skillet can take, whether it's four or five. And then you keep pushing it. But the trick is it must bubble inside. It must, must, must bubble inside. And I can't tell you how light and airy these will taste if they are cooked for two to three minutes on a high, on a bubble, which I'm going to do now. And then you just serve. Generally, two for a plate is more than enough. So what we do normally is first round one, everybody gets, and second round one, everybody gets, and they both get a different kind of a liquid, right? Unless somebody really, really loves the loose one. Normally, the thicker one is what everybody appreciates more because nothing is wasted in your plate if it's thicker, right? So that's the reason. And normally I would serve it with a spoon and a dessert fork. That way you can eat all of it and scrape up everything. The other thing you can do is put a few segments of orange on it, like a very, very pretty picture that Zareen has shared with us. Uh, it's a done thing. You can dunk it in or whatever. Some people, instead of these halves, they cut rings like slices, like wheels. And then they put one wheel on each one. And that also gives a beautiful, it's very cooked, but it gives a very sticky, beautiful kind of a 
uh, flavor to it and it's absorbed all your little uh, cognac in. And that's another reason why you need that fork with the spoon. So as you can see, it's bubbling and boiling and becoming lighter by the minute. And the while the pancake, the crepe is becoming lighter in texture, the actual sauce is becoming more cloudy and thicker. And that's how it should be. Now, we are going to talk about what are the other sweets we can make with these delicious crepes. Orange and chocolate are, is a match made in heaven. And you could just pour a little bit of chocolate ganache over it while serving. And because this is warm and hot, like Zawir explained to us, it is not going to seize on us because it's warm. So it's going to stay nice and melty, you know. Uh, the other thing that my children used to love is Nutella. I don't like it at all. It's a completely processed product, but you can spread it all over a nice warm uh, crepe and enjoy that. It's a very done thing in the European countries where it's for breakfast also. You can leave it open and then spread it over, or you can put a dollop on a warm crepe that has been folded, because generally people don't believe in eating one. They believe in eating at least two or three. So then it's difficult to serve something open, and that's the other reason. Jennifer, why you, don't you add, can you add cocoa powder and make chocolate crepes? Yes, you can, you can. Uh, I. For me, personally, uh, these are my favorite. And I am uh, not anti-chocolate, like, but I'm not a chocoholic from any imagination. Because I live with chocoholics, I know what chocoholics mean. So for my children and my husband and my mom, who used to be a complete chocoholic, uh, she also had a cake business for a few years and everything was about chocolate. Uh, for me, it's not. So, uh, it, like the less chocolate in a dessert, I would never pick a chocolate dessert. I would love a piece of chocolate. I enjoy that and I would eat it almost every day. But I'm not one of those who you have to drag the box away from or hide it from. I'm just not a chocolate. So, for me, it is not something I would experiment with, but yes, I do know that you can add uh, cocoa powder, good cocoa powder, a little bit with the uh, flour, and you'll have chocolate pancakes, you know? It's not an issue at all, and a brilliant idea. But again, like Zawar says, please use the best. Otherwise, you're going to just have a mess, and there's no point eating that, right? So the cocoa has to be really good. And I'm sorry to break up the party, but we are way, way over time. Okay, okay. So I'm done. I'm done. Don't worry about that. But I was going to ask uh, Zara, okay, Zara, what's the best sweet and uh, savory together? What's the best sweet and savory together? To serve, yes. Uh, are you referring to pancakes or just... Yeah, yeah, to great, great. Yeah, great, great, great. Um, See, I have tried chocolate and bacon. Okay. And it tastes amazing because the saltiness. Zareen, your tongue is already out. <laughs> <laughs> the drool is it. <laughs> because the saltiness of the bacon, you know, when you kind of grill it in the oven and then the sweetness of the chocolate really go well. So I have okay. tried it and I really like it. So if you're ever making pancakes, try it. You know, have great some idea. Grilled bacon and have some chocolate with it. it Super. Tastes good. Okay. Good, so good. Okay. A complete full-on calorie session. Crazy. Surely, <laughs> Zareen. Actually, you know, people have this misconception that chocolate is fattening. It's not. In fact, it's very healthy if you stick to dark chocolate. It cuts yes. down your appetite too. So you tend to eat less after a chocolate, you know. 
Now Shepan. there's like another reason to eat one every day after. <laughs> Dark chocolate, yes. Both of you, thank you very, very much for everything. Um, it's been really a very interesting session. And um, Nilufa, I wish I could come over for dinner, really. I wish you all could. Davin and I have taken the next flight and we would have had I great, <laughs> great chocolates. <laughs> but Let's we should touch and hopefully we'll see you in Toronto. Yes, sure. I hope so. Definitely. Thank you, Zareen. It was wonderful. Well, viewers, thank you very much. Our next session is on the 27th of September on presentation, packaging, safety, and health. Our presenter, fondly knows, known as Chef X, will be on all the way from Perth in Australia. So I'm. it's a very interesting session. It's not only for food premiers. The section on safety and health is for anybody who works in the kitchen. So bring on all your your housewives, your home cooks, anybody. And I look forward to having you back with lots of questions. Till then, thank you for being so patient and uh, being around and stay safe and stay happy, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye.